like what you're asking them to do, they can simply um, drop the microphone and walk off the stage. So your approach to customer and really moving them from this anonymous state where most customers begin their journey with you to a known state um, is a very different way of looking at um, identity than maybe um, in more traditional settings where uh, your employees, your partners are somewhat compelled um, to go through your identity system regardless um, of uh, 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 their preference for what they're doing. Now, interestingly, um, there's also a big gap right now between uh, how co consumers view brands and the trust they have with the brands they deal with. And we can see um, over two-thirds of consumers don't trust brands with their data. So you're already starting at a deficit. And really, the manifestation of this, and this was a global survey of over 4,000 consumers in both the US and Europe, and we found that between the US and Europe, there's a similar level of distrust. Interestingly, in Europe, this has led to the GDPR, right? which really put consumers back in control of their data. However, that same distrust uh, exists in the United States. So this really represents a global opportunity for building trust with uh, consumers. Not only do consumers not trust brands, but the majority actually feel like the problem is either the staying the same or getting worse. Because if I give you my information, odds are I'm going to be stalked across the internet with advertisements for your product or service. Because as a marketer, that's often our job, right? To get you to move from that initial interaction to a conversion. And I'm always measured against how am I converting? How am I getting customers to sign up? And a, a sign up is generally super highly valuable and can lead to a, a long-term lifetime value. So I'm willing to irritate a number of people in order to get that initial sign up. But this is causing a great deal of mystery trust uh, amongst consumers. Now, the good news is, is consumers do feel accountability for their security and for taking responsibility for um, their data. Um, in our survey, we found that over 63% of consumers feel personally responsible for protecting their data. They don't feel the brand or the government is going to do a good job of that for them, that it's really up to them. And really, we've seen um, taking a transparent approach to privacy can be quite effective. Um, Facebook, for example, did a major change and shift in their privacy policies about two years ago. And this is something Facebook did independently because they realized one of their biggest barriers to growth was this trust with the consumer and that their legalese around privacy, their terms of, uh, uh, of uh, service, and privacy settings were actually a major barrier to sign-ups. So they actually implemented about two years ago a transparent um, approach to privacy. And I, I, for those of you on Facebook, you probably, every six to 12 months, you get a little refresher, a reminder. Would you like to look at your privacy settings? Who are you sharing with and how are they set right now? And this is um, help spur tremendous growth inside um, Facebook. And when given the opportunity, 61% of Facebook users actually have actively gone in understand their privacy settings, and have made changes and adjustments to those settings. So again, not only are consumers feeling the accountability, but they're also willing to participate in their own um, protections. And uh, as I think one of the questions earlier asked about um, data breaches um, and kind of the notification and how widely publicized many data breaches are in the US, and you can see again that many uh, consumers that realize they're doing business with, those with one of those companies will go in, change the password, add a second factor of authentication, um, or uh, close the account um, if they realize they've been compromised. So again, consumers, when given options and choices, are willing to take those actions. But again, most brands, do not offer um, these as self-service options to their customers um, today. So really the challenge is then how do we build um, this uh, trust and relationship with the customer progressively over time, right? I think in the panel um, earlier there was some good discussion about context and how do we really over time, rather than asking for everything all at once and forcing a tough customer experience, how do we really begin to um, overlay identity into the customer journey in this case from awareness um, through to advocacy and everything in between? And oftentimes, um, as mentioned, it doesn't start with a full profile, a full knowledge of that person's identity. It's going to start with a fragment. And believe it or not, for a marketer, oftentimes it begins with a device ID 
or a browser um, type and location, right? And that's why many uh, of your marketing colleagues will actually start off with devices and have device as the primary identity versus a consumer or an individual person because simply at the first interaction, that person behind the device is not known. But based on cookies and other activity, the device and the method by which someone came in can be known right away. So how do we start to uh, move from these anonymous uh, interactions? And maybe right now there's cookie notification required for, uh, um, for European companies, and maybe you can start to understand who's agreed versus who's clicked past. It's simply a notification. There's no consent given for, for cookie track tracking. However, as you move into things like, say, news alerts, so if you go to CNN.com right now and put in your cell phone or an email and you want to receive news alerts, or perhaps you've gone to your favorite website and you want to receive um, their news newsletter, um, this concept of light registration. All I need is an email, a phone number, but I can now begin to understand what that consumer is consented to from an electronic communications perspective. I can begin to understand, hey, maybe they're uh, interested in sports and wildlife um, versus, um, say, motorcycles or um, sports cars, and begin to understand and build up a profile of that person even before a true identity uh, is created. Now, at some point, the goal is to get them to go through that full registration process. And I think this is part and parcel of what we do day to day, both from a consumer as well as an employee per uh, perspective, setting up the username, the password, and hopefully understanding a little bit of the, the profile of that individual. And this is where in customer identity, things like social identity, social login, um, and a number of different identity providers can come into play to reduce the friction in that sign up process and hopefully um, increase um, uh, conversions. Now, that is not the end of the story. And with consumers, we've seen people very effectively leverage something we call progressive profiling. So for example, Vogue Australia, you can imagine their demographic is very uh, willing to fill out surveys on the latest fall fashion, um, what are the colors of the season. And they're actually, over time, through these surveys and through these questions, building up additional uh, information about those consumers. And in the case of News Life Media, they're actually to take that value-added segment information and provide it to their advertisers and say, you know what, here's a demographic that's very interested in running or sports, and we think we could uh, provide uh, um, kind of interactions with those um, consumers at a value-added um, amount. And then finally, um, enriching the customer profile data um, through something uh, called Identity Sync, which then allows you to connect this up to your CRM, um, into service applications, uh, or other third-party um, ad surveying and other applications that may use that information for personalization. So really kind of building this full picture from that first anonymous interaction right through um, to the end. And of course, um, from an identity perspective, there's a number of key components that are required at each one of these steps, whether that be from consent management and making sure that um, you have the appropriate consent for each data processing step um, through, the, uh, through the process. Um, customer and social profile data, so being able to make sure that not only are you complying with your own terms of service, but if you are offering social logs, in, that you have the right um, consent from a, a Facebook privacy terms of uh, conditions perspective with Google+, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever the network is that you're uh, working with. That you're able to then govern um, that data in the appropriate fashion. Maybe I've consented to one data processing step that allows me to feed that information up into, say, an ad role for personalized ad serving, but I haven't gotten permission to email that user yet, so I can't uh, put that into my email uh, marketing solution. And being able to govern those workflows and information based on the consent um, provided um, by the uh, consumer. And then finally, uh, as a foundation, really all of the authentication and authorization that I think many of you deal with day in and day out. So think of um, you know, the work that we do here in terms of letting people into and out of um, um, systems of identity assurance as being foundational, but not sufficient to meet that broader customer um, use case. And really, um, the better you are at this, the more you can build um, that consumer trust. Um, we talked a little bit about consent management. So again, um, you can see a couple of examples here on uh, mobile devices of perhaps starting that um, uh, customer relationship with an update and an alert, in this case, about the art they might um, prefer, or a newsletter, and then allowing them to sign up with a single click via their social network, and removing and providing transparency in terms of how you're going to use that data so those running shoes you were looking at on a website don't suddenly start following you around the internet, despite the fact that you've already actually purchased um, those shoes. 
being able to provide things like uh, an adaptive and intuitive interface uh, for both capturing preferences as well as uh, consent settings, and then allowing them to review, edit, update, delete, really putting the consumer in control of their profile, of both the data that they've provided you directly, but any other first-party data that you may have collected based on browsing behavior, uh, mobile device, or other location information that you may have gathered um, via their IP address. So again, putting that consumer back in control of their information, empowering them to see what information you have and how you're using it um, within the context of that uh, customer identity becomes uh, quite crucial in terms of the um, customer journey. So again, it's all about um, building up trust over time and putting the uh, consumer in control. And really, this should create a virtuous cycle um, for you. Hopefully, the better you are at the progressive profiling and building customer data over time, the more of a burden and the more um, you need to make sure you're complying with privacy. And I always like to say, with great power comes great responsibility. Right? Um, and really, we see this reflected um, not just within um, the GDPR, which I know has been a huge topic of conversation both uh, today in the workshops, but also um, throughout the, uh, the rest of the uh, conference. But you have to remember the um, landscape around privacy and compliance, particularly when you're dealing with consumers, is, is very broad and complex. I'm sure most of you probably do business well beyond the borders of the European Union and have to deal with uh, things like data residence so obviously Russia has their uh, PDPA uh, legislation which requires Russian citizen data to be primarily stored in a Russian um, data center. China just passed their cybersecurity law also requiring with uh, data localization and data residency um, for Chinese uh, citizens. Um, data transfers between the US and, uh, and Europe uh, are governed under the new uh, privacy shield which uh, replaced the Safe uh, Harbor Act. And I could go on and on and on here. And interestingly, while GDPR is getting all the headlines right now, the FTC over in the United States is leveling some large fines against uh, companies like Vizio, who is collecting um, TV viewer data without the right consent. They actually um, did have a consent setting on their set-top box, but it was something called viewer analytics. Nobody understood what it was, so therefore the consent wasn't freely given for capturing um, uh, the, uh, the data, and they were leveled a multi-million dollar fine for that breach of uh, consent pol policy. And this is in the United States, where privacy is considered to be much more lax than here in, uh, in Europe. There's also things like uh, W3C, which uh, again does um, things so for any company that has a brick and mortar presence as well as an online uh, presence, so uh, a company going through digital transformation in the United States will have to have the same accessibility requirements as their brick and mortar shop. So uh, making sure that your forms are e-reader uh, friendly so that people that are visually impaired can have their sign-up screens um, and their profiles read to them um, versus um, uh, uh, having to read them, obviously. Um, and then finally, um, HIPAA. So really having a strong understanding of the types of information that you're handling, um, the types of um, uh, uh, regulations you might be uh, uh, subjected to, and then being able to de deal with things like um, anti-spam regulations like CASL in Canada. GDPR also has uh, strict uh, requirements around digital communication as well. So again, I think GDPR, because it is new, um, gets a lot of focus. However, we have to remember that GDPR really is meant to be a harmonization instrument amongst a number of uh, diverse uh, legislations across the EU. So it really has a broad scope um, that really requires a hard look, not only at the terms and service and the legal team, but also um, how you're actually impacting your customer experience, which is going to really require um, us as security and risk professionals um, to reach across the aisle to our friends in the digital team that may sit in marketing or uh, elsewhere in the office of the CTO or CIO and really make sure that that customer journey is encapsulating um, the uh, consent, um, the edit, the right to be forgotten, and the update and the transparency to that customer and then also 
the governance that's required around that data in terms of how it's used. For a long time, we in the marketing department have had a very free reign in terms of how we use that data and leverage it across, um, not only within the organization, but also out to third parties and providing that data for segmentation, for ad personalization, uh, for website personalization, and a number of other things that really ultimately are a benefit to the uh, end customer, but do require that consent to be provided under um, this new regulation. And really, again, the interesting thing ab about the uh, customer is it really does allow you to build a, a, a strong revenue-based uh, model. Again, in the marketing department, I know my team, we're held accountable to the number of stage one opportunities that we create, i.e. the number of conversations and people that enter into a sales cycle with Gigya. So increasing that rate by a significant portion, even up to one-third, um, can have a massive impact on um, top-line value. Understanding the value of a registered user, so again, the more of these people that are sign up and feel comfortable with you as a company and an organization and a brand, um, the better off you're gonna be from a lifetime value. And finally, um, that ability to uh, increase engagement and really get companies to engage with you and your um, brand. So again, it's all about building trust with this elusive uh, animal called a customer that really has no allegiance or need to follow a process. They really are going to exit your system if they don't feel comfortable or they don't uh, feel that um, you're uh, providing a, a good service or a good return um, for the data. And then being able to do this in a transparent way that not only enables you to get a customer from anonymous to known, but does it in a privacy uh, compliance way. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your uh, attention this evening, um, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jason. My pleasure. Uh, there was one question from the audience, um, just quickly because we're a little bit late. Um, you mentioned a study where two-thirds of the people, of the consumers, would not trust companies do you have a source? Yeah, sure. Uh, we actually, um, Gigya um, sponsored the study. Um, it was with 4,000 consumers, 2,000 in the United States, uh, 2,000 in Europe. Uh, we have a full white paper, infographic, and uh, uh, have done a, a number of press articles on that uh, story. It can be found on our website. Okay, thank you very much. Great, my pleasure. <laughs>